Hey, what's going on? Today we're going to set up SFML 2.0. We're going to uh, download a C++ compiler and download the source code and build it for SFML 2.0. And we're going to make a good starting application to help you get an introduction on how this all works. All right, let's start off by getting our compiler. I like the, uh, the Mingwing, the GCC compiler for Windows. It's pretty nice and lightweight, and it works really well. So let's grab that one. All right, let's get the newest and download the .exe. I already have it downloaded and installed, but by default, it should go to uh, this folder. If not, you should move it there because it's easy to remember, and uh, you'll always know where it is. All right, so next, we need to grab CMake. All right, let's get the uh, the download link over here and get the uh, installer or the zip, whichever one you prefer. Um, and after that's downloaded and installed, we are ready to grab the source code for SFML. Oops. All right, let's go to a download and grab the snapshot. All right, let that download. and let's extract it. Alright, now one more thing before we get started, we need to add our uh, Mingwing bin folder to the system environment variables. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Um, what you want to do is um, whoops, typo after typo. Um, all right, edit the system environment variables for your, not for your account, just the system environment variables. Click on start and type uh, system env, and you should find this, and click on environment variables. Then go down to path and click on edit, and at the very end, you want to uh, semicolon, and then just the location to your Mingwing bin folder. I already have it there, so I'll click on cancel, but and capitalization is not important either. At least I'm pretty sure, but maybe you should keep the... So it should look like this. All right, and after that's there, you can now um, easily access the, the compiler stuff from CMD without having to be in the, the folder that has them all. All right, so next, we need to actually compile the source code. All right, let's open up our, our CMake. And we want to go inside of here, and where all of the, uh, the CMake list is, we want to copy this folder and paste it in both places. I'm also gonna clear my, uh, my cache, or my cache. <laughs> all right, so configure, and going to use the Mingwing make files and the use default native compilers. Click on finish, wait for it to configure, and everything should uh, configure properly because it comes with all of the required libraries, the Windows one at least. So, all right, after that's done, click on generate, and now we're done. In order to compile, we need to go to that folder, and then just, um, I think it's that. All right, now you let it compile the source code, and shouldn't take more than a minute or so. All right, now we're ready to go. The next step is to move the files in the right folder so that we can use them. So, um, all right, we need to, uh, I went inside the Mingwing folder on my C drive and I'm inside of the source code folder that we just built. So we need to first go inside of include and copy this folder and put it inside of our include folder over here. I've already done that, so I'm not going to do it again, but just move that right there and then go inside of lib and copy all of these files into lib over here. And then after that, we're done. 
except you might want to move these into your System32 folder or your uh, SysWow64 folder so that you can see them. If not, you're going to have to put these in the same folder as your, uh, your .exe after you compile your game. But if they're in your path somewhere, then you won't have to do that. All right, let's get started to the uh, exciting part. I'm going to open up my, my favorite text editor. You can use whatever you like, but I like Sublime Text too. I mean, I know it's kind of pretty. All right, let's start. Uh, let's start writing our code. All right, whenever you want to uh, use the graphics API, uh, I guess you could call it an API, but um, like like loading things like textures and drawing sprites and stuff, you're going to want to include the graphics .hpp file. All right, once we do that, we're going to set up our a few variables for um, our screen. Oops. All right, I didn't make these a constant in case that uh, you uh, you allow for the screen to be resized, and you can change these, and then you can update your graphics based upon these, like the position of your graphics. But I'm actually going to make these constant because um. I'm not going to change the size, but I will allow for full screen. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is make a render window. This makes a basic window that we can draw graphics to and get input and play sound and other things like that. All right, so we need our our main uh, method, which where all of our application code will go and executed and whatnot. All right, so we need to uh, call the dot create method inside of render window. It expects three parameters. It expects um, a video mode parameter where you uh, pass in the, the width, the height, and the uh, BPP. And then a window title and um, the window properties. I'm not going to allow for resize because it um it, ma it makes the graphics look the graphics look strange whenever you resize but um, but we are going to I'm going to show you how to do full screen though I think that's pretty important all right so we want to uh after create I guess it sets app dot is opened to true and so when that's true we're always going to run it this is going to be our main game loop. Right, first, we want to check if the user that closes the window. That's pretty important. I'll go and explain this. All right, so um, every time we're going to create an every tick in our game loop, we're going to create a new variable called event, and uh, if an event happens. This is going to change, and it's going to be picked up by our app.pull event, and the event.type is going to change. If it's closed, we're going to close the app. So if you click on the close button, the application will close. Here you could have something like a, like save, you know, if you have your settings controller. Dot save or something. But we can talk about that, I guess, later. All right, so that's pretty basic right now. And next we need to uh, do our app.clear and our drawing logic will go here and app.display alright this clears the window every tick with a black color if you wanted to you could pass off a, uh, a color value an RGB color value like if you wanted blue or something you know red green blue and that would uh, just be a, a strict blue but if you wanted more like a light type of cornflower blue almost you could do a <laughs> um, 200, 200. I think that would work. Now let's go and test it and see what happens. All right, if we save this right now, first let's actually make a build script. Um, okay. Oops. All right, so we're going to make our. Uh, all right, if you haven't worked with a command line compiler before, it's pretty simple. If we first pass off the uh, the O, it's going to open uh, our binary called our game, our game.exe. And we need to pass off the source code, 
which would be main.cpp uh, right now. And then we have to pass off what we want to link to the... Uh, what we need right now is just window and graphics. And now we're ready. If we open up command prompt and go to our directory, I think this is the right one. Yeah. And then just build. Uh oh. Alright, 11. Um, let's see. Oh, I see. Alright, small typo. Let's try again. Alright, then if we go to our game, would you look at that? A cornflower blue window just ready to be drawn to. Isn't that exciting? Alright, maybe not cornflower blue, maybe more like a sky. But whatever, man. Alright. <laughs> Let's go on to the next step. I um, Honestly, I just prefer to leave it black, but it doesn't really matter that much, though. Okay, well, we need to make a... Uh, I like to organize my things into worlds, like I call it, um, like... You know, stuff like that. And uh, we're going to set up our base world class that our other classes are going to extend. Let's make a new file, a new file called um, worldbase.h. Um, All right, that's strange. When I press Control Shift D to duplicate the line, the uh, the the recording messes up uh, the software. So I'm just gonna do it by hand right now. All right, so what we're basically doing right here is we're telling the uh, compiler to ignore everything that's right here. We want to ignore this if it's already been included into a file that can see another file because if we don't do this it will throw an error because we're trying to uh, duplicate our class uh, our class name and it doesn't like that so we have to just tell it to <laughs> we need to tell the compiler to ignore what's here if we uh, alright whatever <laughs> Oops, I meant to be that world base. All right, so we're going to create a few basic um, virtual methods that uh, that our classes will see. Like we're going to take input, we're going to take draw. Oops, we need to initialize these by making them zero. All right, now we have a few basic methods here, and because we're uh, including, we're setting event as a parameter, we need to um, include the graphics library. Oops. Okay. Now, basically, what a virtual method is, I'm sure I'm going to mess this up whenever I try to explain this, but we're going to uh, have another class that extends uh, world base, and we're going to have these same methods, but without the virtual. What we're going to do is pretty much just going to look like like level world and uh, whenever we call uh, like input it's actually going to call our level world um, instead of this one so uh, hopefully you can understand what I'm trying to say <laughs> alright well let's make our level world class we need to open up two for this one we're going to save one as level world.h and one as level world.cpp. Let's start with the header file. Um, oops, first. Uh, all right, we're pretty much going to do the same thing with this file. Oops. And define. Okay make our class and we need to include our world base file if you're not exactly sure how include works what it basically does is it goes inside of this the file that you're including and it basically just copies and pastes uh, copies and pastes that bit into the file in place of the include line so it just basically re redefines this so that it can see it. Alright, that's pretty much it. And because we're, uh, <laughs> we've already included this file inside of worldbase.h, we don't really need to do it again, you know. Alright, well, let's make our uh, public 
our constructor, our input, and our draw, and update. Okay, so the constructor does not require a data type. I don't really have an explanation for why that is, so I'm sorry, but doesn't require a data type. All right, well, let's go and make our skeleton file. Do our constructor. And All right, there's our basic skeleton file. All right, let's go back to our main file, our main.cpp, and uh, let's set up our basic. Our basic uh, skeleton file. Okay, we need to create a world-based pointer. Um, All right, and uh, making this a pointer because we're going to create a new instance of other things, and in order to do that, it has to be a pointer. All right, so it looks like that. Like, let's say if you wanted to switch to the uh, main menu, target world is equals new main menu world. It's pretty simple. All right, I'd also have like a uh, a change level method, but we can talk about that, I guess, a little bit later. Um, Alright, we need to uh, do a few things here. Input and draw. Oh. Also, because it's a pointer, we have to do the arrow syntax instead of the dot syntax. I'm not entirely sure why that is. I think that um, just a convention to make it so you can distinguish between the pointer and the uh, a non, like a regular type of <laughs> definition. So, all right, it's no big deal though. Oh, we also need to include the um, level world dot h file. All right, next we need to incorporate uh, a timer so that it will be consistent for everybody playing the game no matter what uh, frame rate they have. So I'm going to use 10. I think it's a good number to use. And reset time equals 0. All right, so what we need to do is we need to um, add to our reset time variable. We need to add the app.getFrameTime method. And what I believe this does, I should look at the header sometime, or the source, to see exactly if what I'm saying is correct, but or if I could even figure it out. <laughs> but I think that um, this uh, this is basically the difference in time between the uh, the last frame and the the current frame, the difference in milliseconds between how long it took to reach that. I hope what I'm saying is correct. All right, so what we need to do is now is check if the uh, reset time is greater than game time. And if so, reset time minus equals game time. And here is where we handle our uh, our loop, our like our update loop. Okay, here we go. All right, so like I said, whenever we do it this way, it will be consistent for everybody that plays the game, no matter what frame rate the game runs for them. All right, let's let's make our uh, main.h uh, include file right now. This will be the next step. Of course, the uh, the same syntax. But this time we're going to create some external definitions. Um, All right, so basically what this does is we're going to create an external meta. Um, I think that, uh, well, I know what it does, but I, 
I would like to explain why that why it works that way though. But all right, so if we include the main.h file somewhere else, and we we can refer to app like it was declared inside of that file, but in turn it's actually included into this object, this um, this implementation file, right here, and well we can just access it if we include the main.h file, and then we also our game time, but anytime you use extern you have to uh, declare it twice, but without the extern. All right, in this way we can like make an offset, like offset equals game time, and then you know x plus equals offset. All right, now it's time to start drawing things on the screen. And that's the most exciting part, probably. All right, let's go inside of our level world file and include main. Um, I'm going to make a struct, a structure that contains all of our assets, uh, so that we can quickly access them. All right, we have. Um, our three pictures that we're going to use right now that I made in advance and they are right here right here our background our enemy and our player and right here so we need to create uh, an external method again of our assets like so. And then one more time we need to go inside of here and do... Alright, just like that. And now then inside of our constructor, let's go ahead and load these files. Um, that needs to be image background though. I think in another tutorial I will show you how to load them from memory so you can just um, give you know the people the binary instead of all the pictures as well so that we will basically package them with the binary I think that's pretty handy as well but for right now this is more than a uh, more than fine okay no typos I hope and our enemy All right, like so, we went ahead and loaded all three of these files. And now we are ready to uh, to draw the background, I think. <laughs> all right, let's make a private method. And oh, basically what these things do is the public means that, um, that outside of the current context or scope, you can access these methods, but the private, you can only access them with inside of the class definition. Whoa. That needs to be background. Alright, now then, how simple it is though, it's very simple, is the sprite background dot set texture, and then the location to our background texture. And then we can set the position to Alright, just like that, and then inside of draw, we just call our app.draw and uh, the sprite. Just like that. But first we have to modify our build script. We need to pass in the level world. Also, what we're going to do right now is that every single time you compile, it compiles both of these. Even if there aren't any changes, both of them will still be compiled, which still takes some time. But I think that in a few moments I'll show you how to uh, turn that into a .obj file uh, only once and then link it so it takes a lot less time to compile. But right now this is okay. Alright, that should be everything we need to do. Whoops! Let's find out. 
Oh, that's right. We have to link the system. It's a, it's generally a good idea to always link to the uh, the system as well. Okay. All right. Now that we can run our game, and wow, look at that! Our background is now drawn <laughs> with such little effort. Isn't that exciting? Okay. Let's go ahead and make our player class. Uh, gonna link this already so we don't have to worry about that. Alright we need to make two more two more files player.cpp and player.h Alright our player class is pretty much going to have some of the same methods as our other class but without an extension. Constructor, a uh, input, a draw, and an update. You're a skeleton right now. Uh, oops, we're also going to have setup. Okay, now inside of our uh, our setup method, we need to have a private. Actually, it's going to be public, so other things can access it as well. So, typo after typo. Okay, self dot set texture uh, level world assets dot. We also need to include our level world file, so we can access this variable image player self dot set position um, 100 100 and uh, app dot draw self and we also have to include main so we can access app okay um, next is we need to go inside of level world again And so that our enemies can access this, we're going to create another external definition. Actually, I'm sure that creating all of these external definitions are not too good, but even on big projects, I haven't noticed much of a problem. But instead of doing that, you could pass a reference to the class and then access the player as a public method through the reference. But you know, for right now, I think I'll just set it up like this. And All right, now then it's pretty much the same thing. Player.input, player.draw, and player.update. Oh, whoops. Okay. Oh, I forgot to call um, player.setup. I suppose you could just make this a pointer and do player equals new player instead of a setup method, but I like to have the setup method. All right, and just like that, we have a player on the screen. Let's go ahead and make him uh, controllable by the arrow keys. All right, so whenever you want to take input, We've already done this before. Is we the bit for the keyboard? We want key uh, keyboard. Oh, whoops! I meant keyboard uh, key pressed. Okay, then we need to check if the key code. But fortunately, there is a keyboard namespace, so we can just do it right. We don't actually have to remember the key code. And if 
I'm just gonna set right to true. Let's go through this really quick. Ah, I'm gonna do it like this. I think it's even faster. All right, but first we need to actually declare these booleans. We're gonna make them private. left or right left down up and basically um, if you're not sure what a boolean is it's a true and false value it can either be zero or one <laughs> all right let's set uh, all of these to zero I think by default they are zero but it gives me confidence to to initialize them myself all right next we need to uh, pretty much do the same thing but key released and just set these to false all right now inside of our update method if right is true and left is false we're going to add to our x value by offset if right is false and left is true, we're going to subtract from our offset. If up is true and down is false, we're going to add, we're going to subtract from our y offset, which means up. And if up is false and down is true, we are going to add to our y offset or our y position. Okay, but first we actually need to do self dot set position x y so that each draw the uh, the position will be updated we can get rid of that and um, and just x is 100 and y let's create our float All right, now if we build this, our player will be controllable with the arrow keys. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Forgot to define offset. Oh, whoops, I meant, uh, <laughs> um, event, not keyboard. Sorry about that. Okay. Now if we build the hoe. Oops. Hmm. Oh, that's that's peculiar. I guess I forgot to uh, include the main.h file inside of the main.cpp file. All right, our game. I'm not sure if it's going to be delayed on the uh, the screen recorder, but I can now move the player with my arrow keys. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> I'd say so. All right, now I'm going to show you how to make uh, go into full screen. If you're not already sure, this probably won't work going into full screen for me. So I'm just going to show the uh, the logic. We're going to check if the user presses F11. If so. We're going to uh, create a global variable called um, first we're going to toggle this variable. If it's false,
Okay, and then we need to toggle full screen to false if it's the other way around and exit full screen. This is pretty simple. Whenever you go into full screen mode, uh, pretty much you copy this line. And for the style, you set it to style full screen. You also might want to change around your uh, your video mode parameters because it might look stretched depending on your current uh, video mode. And then to exit, it's the same thing that you had up here. That's pretty simple and uh, pretty cool to have a feature like that that's really basic and easy to set up. All right, I think the final thing we need to talk about is setting up an enemy and detect collision. All right, let's make two more files, enemy.cpp and enemy.h. Okay, same thing we've been talking about up there. Um, I guess I'll do a setup method again. And update. Oh, but we don't need input though, but we do need the graphics library. Alright, and our float xy. Oh, whoops. Well, I suppose we don't even need that, really. I mean, I'm just going to have a... Wait, um... Going to make a float rectangle, and this is going to be the box. It's an invisible rectangle that we're going to always position with the, uh, the self sprite. So that, um... Uh, Whenever the player's self box collides with this self box, we will throw, we'll make something happen. Oops. Let's go ahead and make the implementation. Alright, we need two things here. Oh. I actually do think I misspelled enemy. I'm not sure if it's an E after it. I hope not. <laughs> That's pretty silly, but it's whatever, I suppose. 200. Alright, let's add our enemy. Actually, I want the player to be up to on top of the enemy, so I'll draw him first. Uh, that's how the Z order works in this. If you draw um, something after you draw something else, it will appear on top. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then we need to go inside of um, our H file and create I really feel like I misspelled that. I, whatever. Okay, then just one more time. I need to add the source file. 
and we need to call setup right there. Okay. Uh, oh, whoops. <laughs> I did not mean to make that constant. Just a boolean. Alright, and there we go. Now I can move around and let's make something happen whenever you collide with this thing. Alright, what we need to do is we basically need to uh, draw a box around the player and the enemy that is transparent. In order to do that, oh, X, Y, and 32, 32. These are both uh, 32 pixels. I guess minus the border. You could do um, this, I suppose. and dot height. And I also don't think that it has to recalculate that each time. I think that whenever the uh, height is modified, this is also modified, so it's just you're just accessing a number. It's not having to calculate the height each time. So it's not too slow. Then pretty much the same thing inside of player. But we need the box to be uh, public so the enemy can access it. Um, okay. Now then, in our enemy, update loop. It's really simple like that, the collision. Really damn easy. Right. Or maybe, uh, <laughs> collide. Okay, let's go ahead and test it out. Check out that collision detection. Woo! <laughs> okay, and there's also um, another method that's built in for collision detection, if you want to play around with that as well. I'd like to get a more precise detection is contains. And you can check against two points here. Like, for example, if you wanted to check if the player's feet were only touching the um, you know the the enemy you could do something along the lines of this, but of course um it needs to be modified to however you have it set up. But there you go. All right, that's very basic what we've made here, and I hope that you've learned something <laughs> from what we talked about today. All right, one more thing is I'll show you how to make it um build an object and link the object. All right, I'm just gonna make a build player. Just to show you. Alright, so we're going to um, open a player.o file inside of our obj bin directory, and we're going to pass off the source, the source C, um, C file, of player.cpp. Alright, let's make that folder. All right, now then, if we run um, build player, we'll build our player. Then, instead of player.cpp, we just pass this this off. And now the compile time is a lot less. If you do this for everything, so but whenever you modify the player, you'll want to run the build player script again and just build. There you go. All right, well, I hope you learned something from what we talked about today, and I'll see you next time. Have yourself a good day.